hi, I'm Sonia. I'm the product marketing manager over at Sensible, where we partner with banks to solve receipt-related problems. And what I think is really novel about that is instead of going straight to consumer, we deliver a service by also solving a problem for a bank at the same time. That's because we're a B2B2C fintech. At least that's our business model. And for background, here's what it looks like. And what's really important to know about this is that there are two distinct consumers of our product. And we have to be able to solve problems for both of them simultaneously without compromise. And so this can drive any company crazy. Um, and in the beginning, it certainly drove me a little crazy until we figured it out. So today, I'm going to share the story of how we learn to solve problems holistically two customers at a time. I hope that the lessons learned will apply to you in your role regardless of your business model. So let's start about five years back. We just went live with our first two bank partners. We were fresh off a of Series A, and we were the small but mighty team. We also had this pipeline full of opportunities of banks, all interested in receipt management services for these different use cases. Sounds pretty great, huh? Well, it wasn't actually all that rosy. You see, given our team size, we were overworking ourselves, trying to be all things to all people. It definitely made my job as a PMM at the time a little more difficult. It meant creating 10 versions of every sales deck. Our messaging matrix was bananas. I felt like we had a hammer and we were in search of a nail. Our single product was trying to solve budgeting for the everyday household, helping shopaholics with returns, helping business travelers with their expense report, helping small business file their taxes, helping the millennials split a bill, the baby boomer reconcile their statements, and ugh. Honestly, it made for a feature bloated service. And sure, we had a good product, adoption was good, clients were happy. But good didn't feel great. It didn't feel next level. And there's this great quote that says, sometimes when you try and do too much, you end up not doing enough. And that's kind of what it felt. Which brings me to my next challenge. We didn't have a real connection to the end user. Back then, we were a very sales-driven company, which really helped us understand our buyers and nail that side of the equation. But across all teams, we didn't have this intimate, intuitive understanding of the problems we were solving for the end user. More so, those first two bags we went live with, there is this wall between us and the end user. User feedback was like the scream of broken telephone, and you can forget about detailed usability metrics. If there's any product people in the room, you probably just got a shiver down your spine, but oh, it gets worse. Our success was suddenly at the mercy of our bank partners. They did a less than ideal promotional or marketing effort or buried us in their mobile menu. Our product usage could tank entirely. So by now, some of you should feel a little overwhelmed by the challenges of B2B2C FinTech, or some of you might even feel excited by it. And seriously, if you're in the second half of the group, talk to Omar over there, who's not only awesome, but does Sensible's hiring. So here's what we did to combat those challenges. Uh, we launched an investigation. We wanted to find out who the power users were. As it turns out, self-employed professionals and micro-businesses were uploading a crazy amount of receipts. So for about two months, I was heads down doing some research. Figure, I figured out that this group was grossly underserviced by their bank, yet were becoming the new normal. And in my abstract view, I could point to some of those key functional outcomes we could build a receipt solution for, prepping for taxes and audit proofing their business. And so many companies out there are outcome driven. And that means when you, you start solving problems by starting at the end. But you still need to understand where that story begins and all the things that impact that journey to the resolution. So I still had to understand what those emotional drivers were for those end users, uh, what those anxieties or habits they had that were actually barriers to adopting a new solution. I had to understand their context, where they were when they were actually capturing a receipt, what was going around them, or what was that moment like when they were finally like, holy shit, I need an actual solution to manage my receipts. So, I went out and I tried to find lookalikes to our end users since I couldn't talk to them directly from the banks. They weren't too hard to find. And in fact, this is not a very novel idea. I mean, IDEO cracked the code to solving problems years ago. And every Startup 101 book will tell you to get out of the building and talk to your customers. And after each interview, we just got all these rich insights. And it became unambiguously clearer and clearer what our product and go-to-market strategy needed to be. It didn't matter if we were a sales-driven company or a marketing-driven company or a product-driven company. All that mattered is that we were customer-centric and we were always advocating the needs for our users. Customers are always beautifully, wonderfully dissatisfied 
even when they report being happy and business is great. Even when they don't know it yet, customers want something better, and your desire to delight customers will drive you to invent on their behalf. But seriously, don't take it from me. This is actually straight from an internal Amazon memo by Jeff Bezos. And of course, this is the most customer-centric company in the world. And really, your entire organization really needs to get on this empathy train. It doesn't matter what department or team you're working for. You need to be in on some of these user interviews, attend and observe sales calls, anything customer-facing you can get your hands on. And then use this information to inform your decisions. Synthesize your findings and create journey maps or personas and actually stick them on your wall. In every meeting, make sure you have someone in the room playing that persona or playing that stakeholder so your every decision is based on their needs and how it might affect them. And then practice this every day, even to your own employees. Our delivery team is so great at this, for example. They will bring me a glass of water to every long meeting in anticipation my throat might get dry. Consider it a skill, develop it. You likely already have people at your company who are great at these. Typically, designers are highly specialized in this. Learn from them. If not, take up books, take courses, attend workshops, whatever. Make no excuses. Just do it. And so with all this empathy, our mindset at Sensible started to change. We started to orient ourselves away from this utility of receipt management. And soon we had a new rallying cry because we understood the why behind what we were doing a lot better. We were now championing the future of work. And by virtue of our business models, it meant our bank partners could too. And this is energy, this is so important. I remember leaving one particular user interview and I was in the car on the way back to the office and I almost had this watery eyes. There was this entrepreneur, she was so passionate, so creative, and I couldn't believe how something seemingly small like saving your receipts and preparing for taxes was this anchor for her. It was weighing her down and preventing her from achieving her dreams. And her story and stories just like that were inspiring. It was like fuel for me to take that problem and antagonize it and become obsessed with wanting to solve it for her. And the great thing about energy is that it's transferable. So not too long after that, I actually had a go-to-market call with a prospective client of ours that I was told in advance was particularly critical and skeptical. But I felt like I had this arsenal of market research and all these, this empathy that I could use. I could give this kind of strategist 10,000 foot macro view and this market outlook, but I could also tell a story on this very granular user level. And I was so excited to tell that story of the self-employed and why the bank should care. And guess what? The call went great. The bank got super excited all of a sudden. They were like, yes, I see that in my customer base all the time. We need this. And they were throwing anecdotes back at me. And suddenly, because I was energized and I had these reasons to believe in our product, I could so enthusiastically articulate, they could feel it, capitalize, and bring their own energy into it. And suddenly, they could go back to their institution and really push this project forward. So really, leverage what energizes you and make sure you're motivated by problems. And let that energy flow. That's why often founder pitches are so effective. Founders are the most excited and energetic of the company. And truly, energy kind of leaves you inspired. No customer goes home at night and thinks, wow, like that sensible salesperson really influenced me to get receipts. That doesn't happen. Instead, we want our customers to go home and say, wow, I was really inspired today and want to also champion the future of work. And we started to get sale, and we started to get banks that felt that energy that we had. We started to have this shared vision. And then we were both really enthusiastic about solving these problems for users. And we had way more involved launches, and they were true partners with us. So that's it. That's the end of the ride, or at least the amount of time I have left to speak. I do challenge you when you go into work tomorrow to find ways to generate empathy and energy. And I guarantee you will be a lot more successful in your role. Thank you. Questions? Hi, hi Sonia. Hi. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, you were kind of talking about how you're changing the vision or that problem towards the championing the future of work. Could you expand on it a little bit more and how that, how that goes into your product and how you design around it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this came out both around a ton of secondary market research we were doing as well as investigating our own product because we were selling 
um, our receipt service at the time to personal banking, small business banking, high net worth individuals. And so we were trying to find what are those common behaviors and traits of the user. And this was also at the same time where we noticed this big market trend where a lot of the accounting software or other firms around the world were starting to target um, what they considered micro businesses, which were often businesses with less than five employees or the self-employed professional. And the reason they were doing it is because they were the kind of untapped market. And so a lot of other industries over the years started to slowly want to fill that in. And part of the reason why um, we say it's the future of the work because there's so many other trends and social shifts occurring and competition where people are leaving traditional work more and more to either do their own thing, become freelancers, or start their own business. This is true not just for the younger generations or the millennials that wanted that more independent lifestyle, but even a lot of baby boomers, once they're close to the age of retirement, kind of decide, hey, I want that autonomy and flexibility too. So again, huge kind of market trends in this, and more so even in Europe than North America. So I think in Canada, it's about one third of people are actually self-employed in some capacity. And again, they, their needs aren't really met by the traditional view of banking, and that's why we were finding them across the board. And because banking wasn't designed for them, we saw that as an opportunity to work through banks to make sure their specific needs were getting built. So as we're looking now to expand our product and include additional product lines, it's more about, okay, what unique problems do they have? And again, they don't have an accounting team. These are super small businesses, super time sensitive, so championing them. Uh, you had described a process of, uh, or sorry, your own practice of empathy towards your customers. Did you find any stark differences in your own practice and how to get, um, to how, how to be empathetic with customers if you're speaking to the small business owner who's using your, who's a mm -hmm. user of your service or the, you know, traditional bank consuming, you know, the, your service? Were there, were there big differences in that process for you? Um, so I almost anticipated it feeling more different in the way I would want to structure myself going into these interviews, but the principles are kind of the same. And what we realized, which is might not be a big surprise to you in the room, but the people that work at banks are still people, and they still have these same common motivations, and they still really want you know, to be successful and do something cool and put their name behind something and kind of be a rising star. And we found all these nuances, different people. So it really ended up being more about understanding their personal journey within working at a bank and then tying that into, you know, servicing those higher level bank goals. But it was the same approach. Yep. Hi, hi Sonia. Um, you have absolutely great energy. It really came across. Um, you had mentioned leveraging what motivates you. Could you take us back to when you didn't know what that was for yourself and the process that you went through to figure out your motivation? Yeah, absolutely. So I've always kind of been interested in the idea that, you know, business is really cool. It could solve problems. I mean, I went to business school, um, but I also always loved entrepreneurship. And actually, I was taking this design thinking course, um, and I was learning about it. And part of that course was working with an Ontario credit union to solve some problems in banking. And so as I was also learning about this amazing like problem-solving um, process, um, I realized how many problems there were in, bank, in, ba in banks in terms of as an end user, like things could be better and banking could be better. And for me, it was like, oh, I really want to solve big problems and I want to help make banking better for me but for everyone. There's no reason it shouldn't be. And back then, there wasn't as many challenger banks or tech companies, you know, stealing away at, or eroding at the bank's margins. So banks kind of could maintain a status quo. And even just that interest from that one credit union of, you know, we're open to experimenting, sky's the limits. Um, that felt really motivating because I felt like I could actually make a difference. And, you know, if I partnered with a bank, I could make that difference at a huge scale. Not that you can in a startup, but it's just another way of approaching it. And so um, it's kind of just like this magic moment where something clicked on me during the process of I can make a really big impact you know, even as a even as part of a small scrappy team, if I target a big problem and keep at it. Awesome. Thank you so much.